SJC 12749, Alba Garcia v. Commonwealth. Mr. Rasil. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Luke Rasil, appearing for the appellant, Alba Garcia. Uh, there's three points I'm going to try and cover during today's oral argument. First, that the house arrest and the GPS monitoring in this case are a search and a seizure. Second, that the search and seizure are unreasonable. And third, that where GPS monitoring and house arrest are unreasonable on this record, incarceration premised on unaffordable bail would be all the more unreasonable. So starting with that first point, I think we know that the GPS monitoring and the house arrest in this case are a search and a seizure from the Feliz and Johnson cases. Wait, wait, wait. We know that the GPS is a search. Why is the house arrest a search? The house arrest, I'm arguing, Your Honor, is a seizure in the sense that a person who is under a judicial order of house arrest commanding them not to leave their home at threat of arrest would, uh, in the circumstances, reasonably understand that they're not free to leave that location. And so I think it meets the constitutional test for a seizure under the cases. It's different factually from... Uh, but so is an incarceration a seizure, right? That's correct. And that's what your client got relief from. That's correct. And so I'd say incarceration is an even greater intrusion by the government than house arrest is, certainly. And so you have to look at what is the degree of intrusion and the government interest at issue and measure that against the privacy and liberty expectations of the defendant. came to court and said, please give me a stay and please release my client. And the judge said, okay. And I think that's, uh, yes, that's correct, Ju Justice Gaziano, as was the case in Johnson, where Johnson came to court on a probation violation hearing, said, please let my client go, he'll go on GPS, and it was still a but search. But doesn't Johnson and Feliz basically say you need a reason to put a GPS on someone? Yes. And isn't the reason to put a GPS on someone under house arrest is to make sure they're in their house? Well, I think that's, uh, I would say that's kind of a, a circular form of reasoning, Justice Gaziano, because then you could justify the GPS uh, monitoring whenever there was a stay of execution of sentence, irrespective of how uh, much or little of a flight risk the, the defendant is. Well, but so don't long the interests the change? The don't the balances change after conviction? And we're really not, it's really not necessarily, I forget, it's not necessarily just the balancing of flight risk, is it? There are other interests, it's a whole shift in, in the status of the of the defendant. So uh, I agree there is a shift, Justice Seifer. Uh, I think the, the shift is that we are, we have to be cognizant we're under the bail statute because this is bail while the stay of execution of sentence is in effect. And I think the court that got the shift right is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in that merchant case, which is in the papers. It's 760 F2D at 967. And there the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that the stay of execution of sentence did not pose, uh, excuse me, did not subject the defendant to any restrictions on his liberty. And so I would say certainly the conviction is in effect, um, but the sentence is stayed. Ms. Garcia is not serving the sentence. And so as such, it really is reappearance is the one government interest at play. And I think it's, it's a similar argument to the one that was advanced in the Norman case that's now pending, that when you're under that paragraph one, section 58 run of the mill bail, it's reappearance and integrity of the proceedings. This, this judge wanted to make sure that your client was abiding by her restrictions, right? So she expanded it to allow some, in, some employment. It was originally uh, physicians and uh, lawyer visits, right? And That's then correct. And you came back in and said, well, she's going to get a job. And she said, all right, I'll expand it to allow her to go to her job. That's correct. So this is clearly a judge who was interested in making sure that she abided by um, those restrictions, correct? I think that's right, Justice Gaston. And, and one of the reasons, one of the ways you can do that is to put a GPS on someone to make sure that they're just doing those three things. That's, that's correct. And, but I think we have to look at all of the conditions that were imposed. And I think if the ruling from this court is, well, if you have someone on house arrest, that is going to be, and you can put someone on house arrest whenever there is a stay of execution of sentence, and in order to enforce the house arrest, you can use GPS, that really departs from the particularity showing that Feliz and Johnson says applies to use of GPS. But what about exclusion in zones? And he, certainly, here, the, and I think we have to look at the is, size is that, of the exclusion zones. Is that, is that zones. circular reason, too, if we said exclusion zones is a good reason for uh, GPS? I think if the exclusion zones in and of themselves are the reason mm -hmm. with, uh, for the GPS, I think the, the exclusion zones are an imposition on liberty and privacy themselves. So the exclusion zones must be justified. If there are reasons why there should be exclusion zones, then 
uh, the GPS could be used to monitor compliance with those exclusion zones. But I think if the ruling is whenever there's a stay of execution of sentence, we can impose whatever exclusion zones or house arrest. And I think here the whole world is an exclusion zone other than Ms. Garcia's residence for most hours of the day, uh, irrespective of what the facts show about whether there's a flight risk, if there are interests just to cipher about danger to the community or integrity the, to the proceedings, I think you still have to look at are there facts for this particular defendant that tends to tend to indicate this person is a danger to the community? No such facts in this case. Is this person a danger to the integrity of the proceedings? No such facts in this case. And so I think even if there is some privacy... Is it, 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 wait, isn't the conviction for uh, trafficking in cocaine and heroin a danger to the community? I would say... Uh, Rep show that she is a danger to the community? It's one fact that uh, tends to indicate that whose absence would show she was less of it. But if the existence of that conviction can do the heavy lifting of saying that is enough, uh, even though this person has never defaulted, has always showed up at court, has all these ties to the community, has shown a willingness to uh, uh, come back after, you know, to, uh, mm. excuse me, has an incentive to keep prosecuting her motion for new trial to try to regain her presumption of innocence, that's too much heavy lifting to ask that one fact to do. So maybe I was a little bit too full-throated in saying there's no facts to support it, but certainly I would stand strong saying there are insufficient facts. And I think the primary argument here is that the one government interest is reappearance. Do you think that um, all the other defendants that seek stays would be happy with the decision if we wrote it your way? In the, uh, uh, and I, I mean, with the impact on other defendants seeking yes, stays, I, I think some of them might not get stays if they can't have a GPS put on them. Well, I think... So you're not asking for a blanket rule? No, I'm, I, I'm asking for... No, I'm not asking for a blanket rule. I'm asking for a rule that in each case, if a judge grants a stay of execution of sentence, and by the way, in granting the stay of execution of sentence, the judge is making a finding that there's a low enough flight risk to justify that. This is kind of a cake and eat it argument you're making, isn't it? I don't think so because um, if we look back to Feliz and Johnson and we look at the expectation of privacy that's in place in this case as compared to Feliz and Johnson, at least part of the constitutional deficit that Feliz and Johnson were operating under was the result of the Commonwealth executing a sentence against those defendants, putting them on probation. That was at least part of the constitutional deficit they were operating under. Okay, can we, we just slow down? And that's down. absent from this case. That, no, sorry, Justice just Lowe. No, that's okay. I, I interrupted you. Uh, but if we could just slow down for a minute. So... This isn't really Felice, because Felice, you have uh, not just the initial um, seizure by putting the GPS on, but then you have uh, an actual search of the, the, the data. That's so, correct, Justice so th Lowe. This is really more like, like Johnson, with, with, with the GPS, with the probation and the child pornography conviction. And so I guess... So what we need for reasonableness is the reasonableness, assuming it's a search when someone's serving a sentence and they get a stay. Assume that that's a search. So now we got to deal with reasonableness with that type of search, not looking at data that gives you a mosaic of the person's life. We got what's come up, uh, flight, possibility, um, a three-year mandatory minimum sentence that she's serving, comply with... Uh, conditions, and including being able to leave the house so she can work, so she can help her uh, mother, um, that he's in the midst of, she's in the midst of serving a sentence. She's been convicted of a drug <laughs> case when she has a previous conviction for uh, dealing heroin. And um, the question is, do, does that add up to, uh, to reasonable here? And if it doesn't, then uh, I'm concerned about Justice Cipher's point of, uh, you know, who's going to put anybody on a stay? And, and I understand, as a practical matter, the, the point Justice Seifer, Your Honor, is making and the point that uh, Your Honor, Justice Lowy, is, is echoing. I would push back on one thing that uh, Ms. Garcia is serving the sentence. I think the uh, trial court judge, Judge Kenton Walker, used that descriptor, followed it right up by saying, but the sentence is stayed. And so I think the ruling would be that where the trial court has found that there's a low enough risk of flight and a high enough uh, likelihood of success, to justify stay of execution of sentence, that that's a, a, an area where there should be a real skepticism around um, whether there are facts showing that GPS would nonetheless be reasonable. Um, I don't, I don't, 
uh, think it would be a ruling, if it was a ruling in Ms. Garcia's favor, that would hamstring or provide a meaningful disincentive against uh, stays of execution of sentence. I think, in my experience, they're quite rare um, in any event. But they'd be real, a lot rarer if we go your way. Mm. I, I acknowledge the risk, Justice Gaziano, but I think the decision could be written in such a way as to, you know, if the, the upshot of that concern is that when there's a stay of execution of sentence, a, be, a person can be subjected to GPS without any particularized showing as to that person, so long as there's something like the one prior conviction that we have in this record, and at least a three-year sentence what, what, remaining. What, what, what if it's the situation's like, more like Felix? What, what if the, the uh, de defendant's got an issue that looks good on appeal um, and, and goes in and asks for uh, a stay after serving X amount of time, and, they say, and the defense attorney says, and, um, and, and we'll go on GPS, so you, you, know, you won't have anything to worry about. And, um, uh, please put me on GPS. Um, based on Felix, the analysis would be no different, right? I think, yeah, and I think that that's what happened in Johnson as well. As Johnson said, please, I'd rather have GPS on rather than a sentence of incarceration for my probation violation. And this court ruled you still have to do the reasonableness analysis. But isn't this stronger than Johnson? Because Johnson, we've got, he's on probation and, he, and he's been accused of some um, subsequent activities. Here you've got multiple convictions, including a mandatory minimum that she's serving. I, I just, I, I, I have trouble with the logic of this because it sure. seems like this is a stronger case for GPS than Johnson. Maybe I'm misinterpreting And that. I think we have to look at phase one and phase two as well, because I think Johnson really what it turned on but was- But it, it focus on stage one for a second. Certainly, so Johnson stage one was the GPS being affixed as part of that probationary sentence. <clears throat> And so at that time, that was affixed as part of the execution of a criminal sentence, and the execution of that sentence operated to lower Johnson's expectation of privacy and liberty relative to someone against whom no sentence is being executed. And so I take your point, Justice Kafka, um, that in, you know, in Johnson it was part of that sentence, whereas here we have the sentence stayed, but I think it at least cuts both ways. And I would say it, it cuts more in the direction of if you're not executing a sentence against a defendant, that decreases the government's authority to limit that defendant's privacy and liberty expectations. And, um, Yes. You, 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 you declare the house arrest to be a seizure. Uh, have we ever said so? No, I don't think that argument has been advanced. I think it, it fits. When we look at the cases where a seizure occur, occurs, Barros, 435, Mass 171, uh, an officer pursued the defendant, pointed at him, and said, come here. If that suffices to make a reasonable person believe they're not free to leave, certainly a judicial order, absent any execution of a sentence. If the sentence was being executed, it would be a totally different ball game because now the Commonwealth has at its disposal the full panoply of interests that attend sex in, uh, uh, sentence execution. Um, I think, you know, we have uh, in Eldred, this court um, ruled that a primary goal of, prob of probation is protecting the public from the defendant's potential recidivism. So the Commonwealth would clearly have that interest at its disposal in executing a sentence, whereas bail, what we have here, is assuring reappearance. And with my time left, I just want to... Uh, but, I, I mean, I'm, Chief Justice. Has, has, any court, has any court said that house arrest as a condition of release, and this is a post-conviction condition of release, but even pre-conviction condition of release is a seizure and therefore is const must be constitutionally justified? I nar um, not to my knowledge, I narrowed my search to the post-conviction context, which obviously delimits the number of cases that would be available. In the broader context, um, I could certainly uh, submit a post-argument letter if there was one where it's pre-trial release and there's been a house arrest or ruling one way or the other, whether that's a seizure in the constitutional uh, There's, there's uh, lots of cases on expectation of privacy pre-conviction and post-conviction, right? Parole versus probation versus bail. And I guess I would push back just slightly, Justice Gaziano, because there's lots of cases in that realm when the sentence is but being but, executed. No, but what I'm, so that's the level, that's under the Johnson Felice, that's first stage. The second stage is it's a search, so says Grady, and the search has to be reasonable, right? Yes. And I guess we just may disagree, but if you have someone on house arrest, I want to make sure they're in their house 
Maybe it's reasonable to attach a, a, a GPS monitor on them. Only if the house arrest is reasonable. Right. I mean, doesn't it come down? That's four. Doesn't it come down to that issue? Because so I, cer certainly the GPS is reasonable to enforce the house arrest if the house arrest is reasonable. I think that's right. And, and I, just, I do want to point out, if I may, um, two things to conclude. Uh, <coughs> first is that nobody, uh, neither the Commonwealth nor Ms. Garcia, asked for GPS in this case. It was a sua sponte order. But the second thing I think more... You asked for house arrest? No, no. And she didn't ask for... Nobody asked for house arrest either. That was sua sponte as well. Um, neither side requested that. But if I, if, if I may, and just the, uh, uh, I know I'm over time, but if I may just make one closing remark, Chief Justice Gantz is. Wait, before you make a closing remark, can I just ask um, so is this something we should remand to let uh, Judge Kenton Walker make her findings and do the particularized uh, analysis you're saying we should do? I would say no, Justice Budd, because I brought this motion in the wake of Feliz and Johnson. We had a hearing where the Feliz and Johnson argument was fully made. The Commonwealth was provided an opportunity to carry the Commonwealth's burden to show that this is reasonable. And I think Justice Kenton Walker, and we have it in the transcript, I think it's pages 11 to 13, did make ample what the judge described as findings. So I think all of the findings that could be made in favor of this order have been made on this record. It's just the, the evidence is insufficient as a matter of law to support how, the imposition but how could of GPS. It be insufficient as a matter of law given the conviction that she has I mean you can look at the judge has the the discretion to decide right let me think about what the danger to the community is let me think about what the chance of, of uh, risk of flight is and this is what I think the answer is and the, the reason it uh, justice bud that it's still that it's uh, insufficient as a matter of law is because the conviction is in, imposed the sentences stayed um, there's one prior conviction, no defaults, a lengthy history of all showing I, up. I so understand just, your argument, but and I'm so it, saying if the judge who's making the decision doesn't agree with you. If, the, if that conviction plus the one prior arrest in and of themselves, plus the sentence that's left to be stayed, are enough to justify GPS in this case, my argument is that that's really a categorical ruling. That really says almost whenever there's a stay of execution of sentence, GPS is going to be reasonable, and that... Uh, falls short of the particularity requirement uh, articulated in Feliz and Johnson. Well, it would depend on what the conviction was for. It would? Yeah. And that, that's right. And, and, and I think you have to look at all the facts, but I, our argument is that the facts on this record do not make it reasonable. And the last one I'd like to point out, if I may. How much time did she have left on the sentence? Three years, one month, and three days. Um, and before you wound, I know you're we're keeping you from your <laughs> quite all right. ultimate argument, which <laughs> no, will I, sway I appreciate us. So, the questions, Your Honor. So Thank you. So you. You, should, you're, you should write it down lest you forget it. But uh, Young, he won't forget it. Uh, what is the <laughs> status of her appeal? Excuse me, Chief Justice Gantz? What is the status of her appeal? It is currently stayed to allow her to uh, pursue a motion for new trial. We've had... Uh, that was continued a number of times, not at the defendant's request, but we did get it on. We had a full day of evidentiary hearings. Sorry, Chief Justice Camp, but it stayed presently. Okay, so, and, and, it, and she, stayed, she stayed execution, apparently, because she thought that there was arguably some merit to the motion for new trial. That's correct. I assume. Okay, so she has to decide that, and then even if you, certainly if you prevail on that, then... She'll be on bail, assume, uh, I assume, awaiting a new trial. And if you lose on that, you still have the appeal to go. That's precisely correct. Chief okay. Justice. All right. So what, now that we've gotten through all that. And it's, really, it's, it's <sighs> one fact that I think drives home both um, the lack of any flight risk in this case and how significant an intrusion this is in this case. And it's a fact that's susceptible to judicial notice, and it's the docket entry uh, in the Superior Court action where the motion for new trial is pending. It's uh, docket entry number 63. And you can see it's a November 8th, 2019 emergency motion to attend grandchild's birth, which it was unexpected that uh, Ms. Garcia's daughter uh, was induced into labor unexpectedly. And you can see on the docket that motion was allowed the same day it was brought. And I think it's a testament to the quality of the rapport among the members of the bar in Worcester that we were able to assemble the member of the clerk's office, the DA's office, probation department, in front of a superior court judge, get that allowed so that Ms. Garcia could see Lissandro born. But that is a very deep intrusion into someone's life. And the fact that now there's an, an additional family member here um, in the form of Ms. Garcia's grandson is yet another reason that she's going nowhere. And so if GPS and house arrest are ever unreasonable during a stay of execution of sentence, I would say this is among the most compelling cases where they would be unreasonable. 
Thank you, Your Thank Honors. Thank you. Ms. King. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Michelle King, Assistant District Attorney for the Commonwealth. <clears throat> GPS monitoring and uh, home confinement with windows in this case was reasonable and it was based on a particularized finding by the trial, trial judge who exercised her uh, jurisdiction, uh, discretion rather, um, properly as a single justice found in this case. Now, in order uh, for this court um, to assess whether um, the um, factors here were reasonable, it's a balancing test that the trial judge um, must have undertaken, and I would suggest to you that she properly uh, balanced the factors. Now, um, defense counsel frames this as a situation where the Commonwealth has the burden to prove that the search uh, is reasonable. And I would first suggest to you that the Commonwealth does not, in fact, have the burden uh, on this case. This is a case where the trial judge is to perform a balancing test, and that balancing test looks at the Commonwealth's interest uh, in the need to search or seize versus the defendant's interest uh, in a privacy interest. Uh, and those two things are balanced by the trial judge. The Commonwealth certainly has the ability to uh, set forth factors that would weigh in favor of the GPS uh, monitoring and home confinement, as does the defendant have the ability to set forth factors that would weigh against that. But it is not uh, d the Commonwealth's burden to prove the reasonableness in this case. Now, uh, in this- But you agree that it must be reasonable. Yes, Your Honor, I absolutely agree that it must be reasonable. And the factors uh, that, that the trial judge must look at in determining uh, the reasonableness of it, um, there are a number of factors. Uh, certainly one of the factors is, um, you know, uh, the risk of flight. Um, as this court said in Johnson, another factor is uh, a risk of recidivism. Now, uh, defense counsel frames um, Ms. Garcia's prior conviction as something that happened uh, before this case existed. The truth is that um, Ms. Garcia um, picked up another case and was indicted on another case while she was out on bail in this case. So this isn't a case where Ms. Garcia had a prior conviction from a few years back and then she has this case and she's been perfect while out on bail. Ms. Garcia picked up um, another case for possession with intent to distribute while in fact she was out on bail. Uh, he referred to that as an arrest. Was, that a, was he convicted of that? She pled guilty I mean, and she served me, concurrent she time while serving um, the, the conviction on this case. Okay. So uh, when, you look, when you look at that, it's not simply uh, one prior conviction. Yes, so, so again, back to comparing to Johnson. I want to compare to Johnson and Feliz for a second. So comparing to Johnson, this is We've got two convictions as opposed to a conviction and a potential conviction in Johnson, right? Johnson, he's on probation for offenses, and then he gets picked up, right? Here we've got she's out on bail, and then she gets convicted, and now they've stayed the sentence. I'm just trying to figure out whether this is a stronger case for GPS or a weaker case for GPS than Johnson. It seems to me stronger, right? Yes, Your Honor, I would suggest that it is stronger. And uh, the difference between this case and Johnson is that in Johnson, uh, Mr. Johnson was out on um, post-trial probation, and he had served the term of his incarceration. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, Ms. Garcia has um, at least three more, well, three more years of a minimum mandatory sentence hanging over her head. And so her incentive to flee is much greater than um, Mr. Johnson's incentive because he's already served his term of incarceration. If things don't go uh, the way that Ms. Garcia would like them to go in either the motion for new trial or her appeal, she's looking at um, three more years of a mandatory sentence, which is far far different uh, situation than the well, defendant. If I could, um, I could ask you, you, um, you, you agree with the reasonableness, which I assume means that you agree that, that Grady uh, applies here when you put a GPS on somebody with a sentence that's been stayed. Um, the um, defendant re uh, refers to this uh, Merchant case, United States versus Merchant case from the Ninth mm -hmm. Circuit, which leads me to, to the question, is it, do you have more of a liberty interest 
uh, when you've got a sentence stayed compared to when you're on probation or parole, or do you have less of a liberty interest? Well, Your Honor, I would suggest that it's less of a liberty interest. And if you look at uh, the cases that I cited, there's a, an Eighth Circuit decision in United States versus Kills Enemy, and then there are uh, two state court cases, uh, one from Idaho and one from Washington. And those three cases talk about uh, defendants in the uh, precise position as the defendant here. Now, those are not GPS cases, but the cases do talk about uh, a further diminished expectation of privacy when someone is in this position. They've been convicted. Uh, they no longer had the presumption of uh, innocence, which of course would be the case in, in Johnson as well. But here the defendant has a sentence, uh, as in all three of those cases, that is hanging over their head if, if again, they lose their appeal or um, in, in two of those cases it was um, pending uh, sentencing. So the defendant was convicted and they're just waiting to be sentenced. And the court uh, in those three cases talk about um, more of a dim diminished expectation of privacy for those people because they are uh, in fact convicted and about to go uh, to prison. And I would suggest to you that the defendant here falls under that reasoning. Um, she's, she's got a less um, reasonable expectation of privacy, if you will, because of, of that sentence um, hanging over her head. Now, with regard to the particularized findings by the trial court here, I would suggest to you that the uh, trial court was not only concerned about Ms. Garcia's uh, flight with regard to um, this sentence hanging over her head, but um, Judge Kenton Walker was concerned about uh, the public safety uh, aspect of this, and I believe it was Justice Cipher's question about uh, posed to a defense counsel, um, isn't a person who's been convicted of a drug conviction um, a danger to society? And while I would agree with defense counsel that uh, Ms. Garcia does not have any violent convictions, I would suggest to you that uh, a person being out uh, on the street um, with two <coughs> drug convictions is in fact a danger to our society. And we need n not look any further than our opioid crisis to, to affirm that. Uh, you mean drug distribution or possession with intent cases, when you say drug cases, right? She has uh, this present no, case. No, but I mean when you say da dangerous and for the purpose of uh, calibrating the reasonableness, you're referring to a trafficking case and a possession with intent case, not a straight possession case. Uh, correct, correct, Your Honor. Uh, and, and that is something that's um, also been pointed out uh, by a couple of courts when they talk about uh, one was the kills enemy case and the other was the Anderson case. Uh, from Idaho that talked about specifically um, drug crimes and the danger to uh, public safety that they pose. And if you look at uh, Judge Kenton Walker's uh, findings, I believe it's on page 13, she talks about her concerns uh, for public safety and putting Ms. Uh, Garcia back out on the street. And it's not, again, it's not just that Ms. Garcia has two drug convictions, it's her, the danger of her recidivism is that she had this trafficking case, she was out on bail for it, and picked up another case for possession with intent to distribute while she was on bail. And so that, I would suggest to you, makes it an even stronger case because she, she does have this problem. May I ask you ab about the um, house arrest as seizure? I, I don't know that I've ever heard that analogy before. Do you... uh, admittedly, Your Honor, I did not address that okay. um, in, my, in my brief. And I, I, I did look for cases. I didn't find any okay. cases that talked about that. My focus was on the reasonableness and the fact that the judge did make the required particularized findings in this case. I, I, I felt that that was um, so very clear that that need not be addressed. But I can see that it's an issue this morning. Can, are you done? Mm -hmm. Can I ask about, I, I'm confused by your burden of proof argument, because has there ever been a case where the burden of proof, if it's a search, where the burden of proof is not on the Commonwealth? Yes, Your Honor. So um, admittedly, uh, typically when um, a warrantless search is performed, the Commonwealth does bear the burden to show reasonableness. And there are a number of cases that talk about that. Um, Entwistle is, is one of the more recent. However, um, in this, this court's um, decision in Feliz, uh, if you look at um, footnote uh, 
15, it talks about uh, there being um, times when um, not all searches require a warrant or a showing of probable cause. And it cites uh, the United States Supreme Court case in Griffin that talks about uh, probation cases being um, a departure from times when um, there are searches, but it's not uh, necessary for a warrant or probable cause showing. I'll defer to the author of Feliz in a second, but I, I'm just, I'm confused though. I don't think we said the burden of proof wasn't on the Commonwealth. We just talk about a different type of analysis, right? Uh, agreed, Your Honor. The, the case did, absolutely it was not said that there was not a burden on the Commonwealth, but in reading both of those cases, nowhere did it talk about the burden being on the Commonwealth, and it did distinguish um, this type of case where it's, we're not looking at uh, a warrantless search or a case where we need to um, establish probable cause. This, um, the, the court and fellas, uh, from my reading at least, distinguished uh, this type of case where we're looking at um, the uh, reasonableness of it without regard to whether a warrant was required or without regard to probable cause. And the court and uh, this court in Johnson and Fellies both talked about a balancing test that need be um, established by the trial judge. And it did not in any regard talk about uh, the Commonwealth having a burden what in about, that balancing isn't this test. A, isn't this a 211-3? It is, Your Honor. So, uh, so assuming no um, <coughs> error of law uh, here, and we're, we're sort of assuming that, that there was a contemplation that because of Grady that this was a seizure, uh, why aren't we just seeing whether uh, there was an abuse of discretion in determining the reasonableness of the uh, decision, taking into account all the factors? That is the standard, Your Honor. The, the standard um, on a 211.3 is whether the uh, trial judge um, abused her discretion and whether the single justice um, needed to correct any wrong. And so I would suggest to you that uh, the trial judge, as I said earlier, did not abuse her discretion. It was based on particularized findings. And the single justice um, made findings that this was reasonable, especially given uh, Ms. Garcia's um, three-year uh, incarceration term that was hanging over her head and found that this was not a circumstance where um, the extraordinary powers um, of this court uh, needed to uh, right or wrong in the trial court. Does the record reflect the nature of her drug dealing? That is, was it done at her home or was it done elsewhere? I don't believe the, the record here reflects that, Your Honor. Certainly, uh, the trial judge, who was the judge who made this determination, knew the facts of the case, but I don't think it's, it's reflected in this record. I mean, I happen to know, but I don't think it's reflected in the record. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, what I will ask is I, I will ask each of you to submit no later than Monday of next week, so seven days a 16L letter addressing the issue of whether uh, house arrest constitutes a seizure which would require a constitutional determination of reasonableness. Your Honor, may I just add one thing? This, this court, and, and thank you for that, I'll make sure to do that. This court was very clear in Brangen that the, the trial judge must look at the defendant's uh, financial resources with regard to establishing bail. And uh, w along with that, the trial judge must have the ability to exercise um, their discretion with regard to making sure that the public is safe and making sure that the defendant um, is present. And so I would suggest to you that in this case, that's exactly what the trial judge did. And it's evident from her, her findings that she, <clears throat> she reduced the defendant's um, cash bail um, in, in accordance with Brangen, uh, but, but put other mechanisms in place to ensure that this defendant would show up and that the public was safe. And I would, I would suggest to you that um, this court should affirm that in the, in the trial judges. Okay. But, but just to be clear, I'm not asking either of you to re-argue the issue of the reasonableness of yes, it. Sir. The issue is whether or not uh, it is the house arrest constitutes a constitutional seizure, which under our case law would be analogous to GPS and therefore must be justified by a finding of reasonableness. So that's a purely a legal analysis. Each of you have argued the merits as to 
whether or not, if it is reasonable, whether or not it is or not, uh, but I just want to know whether or not we are essentially, we've, we've said, we, the U.S. Supreme Court has declared that GPS constitutes a search, therefore must be reasonable. To my knowledge, we've never addressed <coughs> the issue of whether a house arrest constitutes a, a search, which also requires a finding of reasonableness, and to the extent that the GPS here is justified to support the house arrest, it may be relevant to our determination, but I'm looking purely for a legal analysis. So Yes, Your Honor, you would, I, I understood. I just wanted to get my closing to, in. <laughs> and keep that to no, no more than 10 pages, and I'm not saying you need to fill the 10 pages, but <laughs> and, uh, and focus, don't limit it to post. You're not going to find anything I, I expect with regard to post-judgment. Uh, I'd focus on basically the more traditional bail view the pre the, the uh, pretrial analysis as to whether or not we must view it as a seizure much as we do much as we view gps okay thank you Your Honor. uh thank you with that we will all right <clears throat> hear me hear me hear me